Chapter Sixteen of the Spider by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Sixteen: The Search. While Vernon desperately tried to wrench open the front door, Towton, with the quick foresight of an old soldier, ran back into the drawing room and lifted the window sash in less than two minutes he was outside and hastened to release his companion luckily in his hurry hest had been unable to extract the key from the lock so a swift turn of the wrist soon removed the barrier vernon and the colonel set off hot-footed in pursuit of the fugitives and as they plunged into the fog caught a glimpse of gale and his wife hurrying into the hall with scared faces doubtless attracted by the ominous sound of the pistol shot but there was no time to explain as every moment was of value and the two men put their hearts into the chase the sudden autumnal fog which had so unexpectedly descended had turned the atmosphere to thick wool so that it was difficult to breathe let alone to see on all sides the gloomy mists shut in the prospect and after racing vaguely for some minutes down the silent road the pursuers halted by mutual consent to listen for possible flying footsteps not a sound struck on their ears it might have been the middle of the night so dense was the darkness and so silent the whole neighbourhood they could not tell in which direction the two scoundrels had fled and on the face of it pursuit was absolutely useless we might make for the railway station suggested the colonel they may have gone there vernon shook his head i doubt it maunders is too cunning and hest too desperate to think of taking the train to waterloo but in any case i'll send a wire to the station-master asking him to detain them maunders can be recognized from having no hat there are many men who wear no hat nowadays said towton dismally it is not a distinguishing mark worth much but how the dickens are we to find a telegraph office in this fog vernon looked around and noted a weak flare of light illuminating the darkness followed by his companion he walked towards it and found that it came from the windows of a grocer's shop at the corner of the road entering quickly he asked for the nearest telegraph office and learned to his great satisfaction that it was at the chemist's two or three doors down the worthy grocer looked somewhat alarmed at the entrance of two gentlemen without hats for in their haste vernon and his friend had forgotten to take them but they gave the tradesmen no time to ask questions and by closely skirting the shops round the corner managed to find that of the chemist here vernon sent a wire to the station-master at waterloo instructing him to detain two men one dark and one fair without a hat who might possibly arrive by an early train he added a meagre description of their dress so that the telegram proved to be somewhat lengthy but i fear it is useless said vernon as they left the shop and had handed the wire to the startled chemist they won't take the train i'm certain and even if they do my description is not clear enough unless the waterloo station-master happens to be singularly intelligent we can but hope for the best and we have done all we can said towton in a decided tone what's to be done now we must return to siddons villa both to get our hats and see gale how are we to retrace our steps in this fog hatterby road is just round the corner and by keeping to the railings of the gardens we are bound to find the house it was as vernon said they had raced in a straight line down to the grocer's shop at the corner and had not left petterby road until they went to the telegraph office on recovering the bearings of the first shop they carefully felt their way up the road reading on every gate the designation of each house in this way after some ten or twelve minutes had elapsed they managed to strike siddons villa and again found themselves at the front door it was closed and also was the window i hope gale has not run away also said vernon ringing the bell do you suspect he has anything to do with the business who knows on the face of it he looks innocent and maunders certainly swore that the old man was ignorant but maunders is a liar and here the door was cautiously opened and the white face of professor gale became visible who is there he asked in a trembling voice mr vernon and colonel towton said the latter gentleman we have returned to get our hats and to explain 
you won't fire any more pistols my wife is almost fainting and i don't like this sort of business what does it open the door open the door cried the colonel testily you shall have a full explanation mr gale seemed reluctant as he apparently took them for robbers and dangerous rogues so vernon losing patience forced the door back and the old actor along with it they faced the professor in the hall and saw that he was holding an old-fashioned blunderbuss probably a stage property used in the miller and his men and other out-of-date plays in the distance and sheltering herself behind her husband was mrs gale grasping a poker in her trembling hand the pair seemed to be thoroughly frightened and considering the circumstances it was small wonder that they were i have sent maria for a policeman quavered mrs gale and both my husband and myself are armed i hope maria doesn't lose herself in the fog said vernon good-humouredly and in spite of his vexation at the escape of the spider and his jackal in heaven's name what does it mean demanded the professor somewhat recovering his dignity come into the drawing-room and we will explain said towton with some impatience for he had small leniency for cowardice there's nothing to be afraid of mr vernon and i are honest men you have got rid of the villains the villains shrieked mrs gale trembling violently and dropping the poker maunders and hest said vernon carelessly come in he preceded his friend and the gales into the drawing-room quite certain from the way in which they had behaved that they knew nothing of the wicked doings of hest and maunders when the door was closed and every one was seated vernon proceeded to examine the actor and actress the situation as professor gale said afterwards was highly dramatic you must answer my questions frankly said vernon addressing the couple if you do not the police may interfere the police shrieked mrs gale turning as white as chalk the professor silenced her with a gesture and spoke to vernon with great dignity young man he said striving to keep his voice from trembling i pay my rates and taxes my bills to my tradesmen and my rent for our home under these circumstances i cannot see why you should talk of the police i speak of them in connection with what has taken place and you may well do so young man to fire a pistol in a private house that was an accident vernon hastened to explain my revolver went off when mr hest assaulted me why should mr hest assault you demanded mrs gale much astonished that's a long story tell me vernon turned towards the professor while towton held his peace and nursed his hat what do you know of maunders know of him said the amazed gale looking thoroughly puzzled i know no more than that he is a friend of mr hest's who called last night and who was requested by mr hest and not by me to stay the night i have never set eyes on him before did miss hest ever mention him yes she did broke in mrs gale who was listening intently she told me that he was a friend of hers in love with miss dimsdale and mentioned that he was the only man she had ever seen handsome enough to play romeo as a romeo should be played professor gale nodded his head graciously i agree with miss hest there he said gravely mr maunders is indeed handsome but she never told us anything about him mr vernon save what my wife has related and mr hest what do you know of him nothing more than that he is the brother of my talented pupil he came with the message from his sister who is at her ancestral halls in yorkshire to the effect that she would return in a month or perchance earlier to fulfil certain engagements which i have procured her i invited him to stay here during his stay in town why did you asked the colonel speaking for the first time gail looked embarrassed but mrs gale spoke for him mr hest we know is very rich she said frankly and both my husband and myself wish to have a theatre of our own we thought that if we showed him some hospitality he might finance us i must say she added looking puzzled that i wondered that such a rich man was content to accept our humble lodgings instead of going to a swell hotel but he seems to be easily pleased it was not that hetty said the professor quickly mr hest simply remained here so that he could persuade me to induce my talented pupil to give up reciting as he dreaded lest she should go on the stage and she ought to be an actress in my humble opinion 
for her capabilities are of a very high order as lady macbeth or in any of sardou's characters such as la tosca fedora and the rest she would produce a sensation the speech of both man and wife seemed frank enough and they appeared to be a couple of simple people devoted to their profession and quite ignorant of evil vernon glanced at towton and saw from the expression of the colonel's face that he thoroughly believed them still so as to be quite sure of his ground he asked another question miss hest as a reciter or as an actress may be all that can be desired but do you and mrs gale like her personally do you think she is what we call well er straight yes cried the woman forcibly miss hest is one in a thousand she is a kind-hearted lady who sympathizes with those who struggle that is quite right said the professor with dignity many a time has miss hest assisted us when tradespeople have worried i am sure that she would have persuaded her brother to enable us to enter into management in the long run as she has every confidence in my capabilities and in mine said mrs gale jealously she said that my amelia in otello was the best performance she had ever seen but now gentlemen the actress rose to give effect to her words may i inquire why you ask these questions and why you come here to fire pistols in a peaceful home at the beginning it had been in vernon's mind to tell the whole story right out and to tax the couple with complicity but they really seemed to be entirely ignorant of hest's true character and evidently had only lately met maunders he therefore did not think it wise to reveal what he and the colonel knew lest the gales should gossip about the matter and until he had consulted drench the young man did not desire that this last unusual affair should become public he therefore shot a warning glance at the colonel and answered cautiously it is only a private matter mrs gale which is not worth explaining the pistol shot was an accident but you said that mr maunders and mr hest were villains she persisted ah i spoke somewhat harshly being a trifle excited they have treated me and my friend here very badly when we came for redress how their consciences smote them you can judge from the fact of their flight you will possibly never see them again but if they do chance to return you must wire to me at once to the athenian club pall mall i don't like these hints and suggestions of evil sir said gail restlessly and certainly i should never think of telegraphing to you unless mr maunders and mr hest give me the leave and why sir should they not return don't seek to know any more mr gale but do as you're told said vernon in a peremptory tone and also it will be wise if you and your wife hold your tongues over what has happened and stop the servant from talking suppose we don't demanded mrs gale aggressively in that case you will get into trouble how dare you how dare see here colonel towton rose angrily we have reason to believe that these men are connected with the spider mrs gale shrieked and the professor turned pale both knew that terrible name which was so freely mentioned in the papers do you mean to say we say nothing said vernon sharply and my friend here has perhaps said too much but it is as well that you should know the necessity of keeping silent tongues in your heads we know nothing of these matters cannot be expected to i am quite aware that you are innocent of complicity interrupted towton but you both must promise to be silent until you have leave to speak and if not already i have told you that the police will interfere observed vernon coldly this business is concerned with the spider so for your own sakes hold your confounded tongues the gales however were not so easily commanded they wished to know how hest and maunders were connected with the spider and if they were in any way accused of being as they termed it in the know but the arguments and commands of towton together with those of vernon gradually induced the worthy couple to listen to reason in fact at the end of half an hour both were thoroughly terrified into thinking that their reputation might be ruined were it known that men connected with the spider had been under their roof neither gale nor his wife were averse to being mentioned in the papers or to securing an advertisement so as to add to their theatrical fame but the publicity likely to be procured from the late episode was not the sort they desired they therefore finally agreed to keep silence about the strange interview and the flight of their guests 
and also declared that they would make maria hold her tongue nevertheless their curiosity remained unabated and vernon had to promise them that it would some day be satisfied you shall know all when the time comes he said when taking leave but keep silence until the appointed hour lest you get into trouble this speech being somewhat stagey sounded pleasantly in the ears of the couple and towton left the house with his friend quite satisfied that professor gale and his wife and their servant would say nothing of what had taken place and now said the colonel let us grope our way to the station after we reach town we can see drench vernon agreed and by following the line of houses they finally managed but with some difficulty to get to the railway here they had to wait for a considerable time for a train as the ordinary traffic was somewhat complicated by fog it was eight o'clock before they reached waterloo and they learned from the station-master that nothing had been seen of the two men alluded to in the telegram although each train in the barrier of the platform it arrived at had been watched by the police vernon was not surprised at this intelligence i thought both hest and maunders were too clever to risk a wire to waterloo station as they knew i would send it what's to be done now let's go to your rooms and send a telegram to drench at hampstead asking him to come down the fog is still thick said towton as they stepped into a taxi perhaps he won't come hang it every possible obstacle seems to be placed in our way the blackguards will escape not out of england at all events said vernon grimly when we explain everything to drench he will have all the stations and all the ports watched we'll catch them sooner or later but the young man spoke with more confidence than he actually felt as he knew that hest was extraordinarily clever in concealing himself as the spider he had baffled the police for years and being an arch-criminal would be dexterous enough to escape even out of this tight corner he began to consider what was best to be done after sending a wire to inspector drench when his meditations were broken in upon by the colonel do you really believe that hest is the spider of course didn't you see his face change when maunders spoke and didn't he cut and run when he saw that the game was up that certainly looks like guilt and yet it seems incredible the man always has lived in yorkshire whereas the spider is supposed to live in town no one has ever known the whereabouts of the spider said vernon coolly and it is as easy to write blackmailing letters in yorkshire and post them in london as to live in town altogether for that purpose besides his sister told me herself that hest frequently went away for days and weeks at a time doubtless he was attending to his nefarious business in london how do you reconcile this devilry with his philanthropy it seems odd doesn't it but we know that the worst criminals have their good points there lives some soul of good in all things evil you know i rather think said the colonel grimly that hest looks upon himself as a kind of modern robin hood who takes from the rich to give to the poor he blackmailed wealthy folk in order to build his bally reservoir and his confounded schoolhouses robbed peter to pay paul as you might put it rob devis to help demos is the way he would put it said vernon with a shrug however we have made a great discovery and one which the police will thank us for making when hest is captured many a rich man will sleep easier yes when he is captured but that won't be easy i agree with you the spider is as clever as his father the devil hm added vernon thoughtfully i wonder if his sister knows anything about his infernal doings no said the colonel decidedly i don't like miss hest as i think she is too imperious and masterful and wants her own way too much all the same i don't believe she could have countenanced her brother's behaviour besides she was always away from him and he doubtless carried on his pranks without her knowledge you defend her i thought you didn't like her i admitted only a moment ago that i did not snapped the colonel as the taxi cautiously felt its way up whitehall but i must be just to her the poor woman will suffer as it is when her brother's criminality becomes known it will ruin her reciting business that's true and there is no chance of keeping the matter quiet hest must be captured and imprisoned hanged you mean remember he murdered martin dimsdale vernon shuddered i suppose he did was his reluctant admission i am sorry for miss hest as contrary to your opinion i think highly of her she may be masterful as you say 
but ida is so weak that it is just as well that she should have someone to lead her in the right way oh miss hest has led her in the right way no doubt retorted the colonel but i prefer to be the guide myself see here vernon come down with me next week to my place at bowderstyke what for we have to hunt down hest and maunders we can safely leave that to drench and his underlings i want to get ida away from gerby hall sorry as i am for miss hest in having such a brother i don't want ida to continue under her protection any longer especially as she wants to marry her to maunders maunders will have no chance now said vernon with a grim chuckle but you are a bachelor towton so ida will scarcely be able to come to the grange i shall ask her aunt down as chaperon lady corsoon good and ask lucy also for my sake with great pleasure i think that the removal of maunders from my path and yours will result in the courses of our love running smoother ah here we are and i'm glad as i want drink and victuals after the long cautious creeping through the fog the two gentlemen arrived at the colonel's rooms and bentham was sent out for food having dined they smoked and talked while waiting for inspector drench but he never came a telegram arrived instead stating that the fog prevented his keeping the appointment and it also prevented vernon from getting back to his own quarters so the colonel put him up for the night next day the hunt for the criminals began in earnest before drench arrived which he did at eleven o'clock professor gale came to the athenian club where the gentlemen were waiting and produced a wire which had arrived for hest on that morning he had not opened it being afraid but brought it intact to vernon that young man had no compunction under the circumstances in reading it and found that it was from francis hest to her brother asking him to return home as diverse matters connected with the estate required his attention sent first thing this morning said vernon passing the wire to the colonel poor woman she doesn't know that her brother has been found out the wire was shown to inspector drench when he duly arrived and he was exhaustively informed of all that had taken place he was naturally both astonished and interested but nevertheless expressed himself annoyed that civilians should have proceeded so far without invoking the police drench gave both the colonel and vernon to understand that if he had been on the spot hest and his accomplice would not have escaped so easily a view with which they privately differed although they did not think it wise to say so but towton did intimate to the inspector that he was a military man and not a civilian whatever vernon might be drench declined to take any notice of this remark the inspector also questioned gale closely but could learn nothing from him of any moment since the old actor knew nothing and was greatly agitated over the whole affair finally bidding all three hold their tongues drench sallied forth to search for the missing pair he saw the scotland yard authorities and wired to all the ports and railway stations in the kingdom as yet and because he desired to keep the affair out of the newspapers drench did not advertise in the journals or by handbills otherwise in every way he strove to find the fugitives he might as well have attempted to find a shell at the bottom of the atlantic day after day went by and no news was heard of hest or maunders and from the moment they had been swallowed up by the fog at isleworth nothing had been seen of them they had not so far as could be ascertained passed out of the kingdom and certainly they were not to be found in the kingdom itself like macbeth's witches they had made themselves thin air like the children of Korah and Dathan, they apparently had been swallowed up by the earth. But thanks to Drench, the discovery of the identity of the spider and his subsequent escape had not been made public, and the press knew nothing of what was taking place. But the time had now come when publicity was absolutely necessary. "'There's nothing else for it,' said Drench, and Vernon, in spite of his wish to keep things quiet, agreed with him." End of chapter 16 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California Chapter 17 of The Spider by Fergus Hume This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins Chapter 17 In the Train within a week of the episode at isleworth colonel towton took vernon with him to yorkshire inspector drench was still searching for the fugitives and was unable to find them 
true to his reputation the spider had covered up his tracks in a most masterly manner and there was not the slightest clue to indicate his whereabouts presumably maunders was with him as he had not returned to his rooms in planet street nor had he been seen in any of his usual haunts about town this was to be expected as maunders had as the saying goes gone under and the society wherein he had glittered so gaily would henceforth know him no more it seemed a pity that a young man with talents and good looks and social positions should have ruined his life at the very outset of a promising career but there must have been some criminal strain in maunders which came to the surface in prosperity instead of being revealed by poverty he was as coleridge says about people with such natures a fool in a circumbendibus however it was useless for vernon to mourn over his old school friend's downfall he had done his best to keep him in the straight path and had failed to prevent his feet from straying he therefore as there was nothing else to be done at this eleventh hour washed his hands of him and left him together with hest to the tender mercies of the law as represented by the inspector now that drench had all the threads in his own hands he resented any one else weaving them into ropes for the necks of the criminals as he apparently wished to secure all the glory and honour of the capture to himself both towton and vernon were rather glad that the inspector took this view as they wished to have nothing more to do with the matter and before leaving london for bowderstyke vernon shut up his covent garden office and formally renounced his pseudonym of nemo as by this time he was officially recognised as his uncle's heir he could well afford to do so sir edward however still lingered between life and death so it was doubtful when vernon would enter into his kingdom while the train was flying through the autumnal landscape towton and his guest made themselves comfortable in a first-class compartment which they had secured to themselves for the purpose of uninterrupted conversation they were still deeply interested in the case and looked forward anxiously to the capture of the spider it was only right that he should suffer for his dastardly crime in murdering an old and inoffensive man as to maunders he was evidently hand in glove with the cleverer rascal and would undoubtedly be given a long term of imprisonment thus society would be rid of two dangerous people and those with secrets would sleep the easier knowing that one asmodeus was dead and the other safely locked up but i don't know what poor mrs bedge will do said vernon looking dolefully out of the window does she know anything asked the colonel throwing down the morning paper which he had been reading and settling himself for a talk vernon nodded i saw her yesterday she sent to ask me what had become of constantine i was obliged to tell her do you think that was kind or wise i think so decidedly it was better that mrs bed should learn the truth from a friend and see it crudely printed in the daily papers and there it is bound to appear sooner or later drench will have to catch the spider first said the colonel coolly no easy task as we know what did she say at first she declined to believe it badly as maunders has treated her she kept insisting that it was all a mistake and that constantine would appear to put matters right what wonderful faith these women have vernon bless them yes they go by their hearts entirely in that case remarked towton dryly mrs bedge must have known that maunders is not the saint she tries to make him out to be i did not say that she went by her instinct replied vernon equally dryly there is a difference between that and heart love because constantine is her sister's child and her adopted son mrs bedge's heart which he has almost broken cherishes him fondly but her instinct must have told her long ago that the fellow was a scamp of the worst sort he's a thorough-paced scoundrel said the colonel vigorously mrs bedge declined to take that view of him she wailed that he had a tender heart and was led away because he had a weak nature in fact her defence was that of a man being his own worst enemy maunders certainly was he had all the gifts of the gods yet yet fell because the greatest gift of honest purpose was not given finished vernon hang it all towton scamp as the fellow is i am sorry for him i'm not growled towton savagely 
ah you did not play with him as a child nor did you go to school with him my friend although i'm bound to say that constantine was always a selfish chap what you would call a rotter i would call him nothing of the sort vernon i detest slang that's a mistake slang frequently hits the nail on the head when the king's english misses it altogether slang conveys much in little and oh the deuce take your philology go on talking about mrs bedge there's no more to say maunders has pretty well drained her but she has enough to live on and the hampstead house is her own towards the end of our conversation however she let out that she was not surprised at connie's behaviour as she rather expected it hm somewhat contradictory why well it seems that maunders father the greek mavrocordato you know was rather a bad egg himself he worried his wife mrs bedge's sister that is into her grave and swindled his partner before he committed suicide i never heard that before no mrs bedge always kept it quiet for the boy's sake until she let it out to me in her grief yesterday mavrocordato he took the english name of maunders bolted with a heap of his partner's money and shot himself at corfu whither he was traced by detectives mrs bedge adopted the son and did her best to train him up as an honest man she tried her hardest i'm certain but what's bred in the bone you know colonel towton folded his arms and stared straightly before him poor devil he was considerably handicapped by such a father i wonder vernon for how many of our deeds we are responsible when you take heredity into consideration some sin because they like it but many because they can't help it let us give maunders the benefit of the doubt and say that the sins of his father were visited on him and of course we must not forget that hest is an extremely clever and strong-minded man who could and did easily control maunders weaker nature there's something to be said there assented the colonel thoughtfully i dare say hest entangled the poor wretch in crime before he well knew what he was about and once committed he would be compelled to remain in the mud but hest himself vernon what do you make of him i don't know enough about him to give an opinion perhaps when we see the sister she may tell us something oh by the way i received a letter from her two days ago about which i intended to speak to you vernon all this bother and worry put it out of my head i left it at home unfortunately but i can tell you the gist of it vernon looked interested what did she write about and why to you she wrote to me because she wants me to marry ida i really don't see what she has to do with that remarked vernon with a shrug for ida is surely of an age to choose for herself i always told you vernon said towton deliberately crossing one leg over the other that ida being less masterful than miss hest is usually guided by her and that i objected to the guidance ida liked me more than any one else before that handsome scamp came along then she became infatuated with him and miss hest did her best to induce her to marry him but the sad death of dimsdale took ida's thoughts off maunders and as i judge from the letter ida wrote me from gerby hall miss hest tried to get her to love the man again failing that she attempted to get ida to marry her brother only he came up to london not feeling disposed to fall in with his sister's views you can therefore see that miss hest sways ida a great deal and for that reason i have come to get her away from such dangerous company doubly dangerous now that we know francis hest is the spider vernon shrugged his shoulders it's rather hard to blame the sister for the brother's delinquencies he said judicially and now that he and maunders are out of the running she will place her weight in your scale in fact from your late observation she has already done so you should be very pleased colonel whereas you seem to me to be ungrateful i don't want ida to be induced to marry me by miss hest's representations vernon said towton hotly it's a liberty on her part to interfere with my wooing lady corsoon comes down to-morrow with her daughter and i shall ask her to go to gerby hall and bring ida back with her then we will have finished with these shady people and ida will marry me of her own free will well colonel replied vernon pacifically i hope things will turn out as you expect but what did miss hest write about about her brother she asked me if i had seen him and what was the matter with him vernon looked puzzled i don't understand does she suspect 
she suspects nothing broke in towton impetuously but she stated that she received a letter from her brother four or five days ago saying that he intended to leave england for ever as he was tired of civilization he enclosed a deed of gift making over gerby hall and its acres to her as he intended so he said to earn his own living when abroad naturally miss hest could not understand this and wrote asking me what was the matter did you explain no i wrote saying that i was coming down to my own place and would tell her all i knew when i arrived but you can see vernon that hest is still in london he was six or seven days ago but he may have gone away since said vernon cautiously who drew up the deed of gift i can't say miss hest did not explain that why because if it was some lawyer we might be able to question him regarding hest's latest movements huh so hest has bolted well i am not surprised at that but i am rather astonished he should surrender his property oh well i expect his business as the spider has made him quite a rich man remember the blackguard has been blackmailing successfully for three or four years he knows that his sister has nothing save what she makes by her reciting so perhaps his conscience smote him and so he made his deed of gift it's a lucky thing for her as gerby hall is a fine old place although rather gloomy and there is a decent income of one thousand a year attached to it farms village rents and all that sort of thing you know it's queer hess should have behaved so well when he is such a scoundrel towton you told me he quarrelled with his sister and certainly from the remarks she made about him to me she did not seem over fond of him blood is thicker than water said the colonel sententiously and dog does not eat dog i agree with your first proverb but not with the second towton miss hest is not of the same breed morally speaking as her brother and no doubt will be horrified when she learns of his wickedness probably you always defend her i am just said vernon coldly so far as i can see she is a clever woman of good principles although i admit rather masterful her brother has done a wise thing in handing her over the property whatever his reasons may be she will be an admirable mistress oh as to that hest was a great benefactor to all the villages around and the people swear by them but if he has bolted with maunders drench will have to let the matter drop but if he is captured no one here will believe that he is a murderer and a blackmailer they know him only as a good landlord and a kind friend and we know him as a criminal strange that two such diverse natures can exist side by side i dare say hest hoped that his good deeds would pay for his bad ones said the colonel carelessly i shall be glad if he escapes richly as he deserves to be hanged for murdering dimsdale it will be just as well if the whole thing is buried in oblivion then i shall marry ida you miss corsoon and miss hest can play the lady of the manor here as she pleases what about the dimsdale property if it belongs to lady corsoon she must have it if maunders story is a lie which it may be i shall stick to it on behalf of my wife however we may hear from venery of singapore in a few weeks my letter must have nearly reached him by this time you can learn the truth of the story nearer home said vernon after a pause miss jewin the housekeeper at gerby hall told the story to maunders according to his own account i shall question her you may be sure said the colonel grimly but i want to hear from venery also oh i'm sick of talking about these things he added with a yawn it's time for forty winks and forthwith he closed his eyes after settling himself comfortably in his seat vernon not inclined to rest lighted a fresh cigar and buried himself in a book it was five o'clock when the travellers reached bradmore the nearest station to bowderstyke it was ten miles to the valley but the road was excellent and towton's motor-car awaited them in ten minutes the baggage was packed away and vernon with his host was safely ensconced in the back part of the machine which was covered with a hood towton asked vernon if he would care to drive but as the offer was refused and the colonel himself did not feel in a sporting humour the conduct of the journey was left to the smart chauffeur he appeared to be well acquainted with the country and as the road was somewhat lonely the motor travelled towards bowderstyke at a great rate of speed the motion was exhilarating and the view on either side of the roadway extremely picturesque 
so vernon enjoyed himself greatly in the fresh air after the close atmosphere and the monotony of the train with the wind blowing in his face and the smooth easy gliding motion he felt like a flying bird or at all events as though mounted on one the country was wild and barren consisting mainly of interminable stretches of moorland mounting up on either side of the road to considerable heights occasionally there was a dip covered with green grass and trees already beginning to shed their leaves but for the most part the sombre moors darkening in the falling light spread solemnly to right and left it was rarely that a house or a village was passed and only every now and then could vernon catch a glimpse of cattle or human beings this country would get on my nerves he said to his companion it is like the weird landscape described by browning in his child roland poem these telegraph poles are the sole signs of civilization oh we'll come to a more cheery aspect shortly said towton smiling for my part i love the gloom and the loneliness of our moors many a time in the garish indian days with a burning sun and the hateful blue sky i have longed for dear old yorkshire everyone to his taste said vernon with a shrug i prefer something much more cheerful you are a cockney at heart vernon i dare say london is good enough for me towards the end of the ten-mile stretch from the station signs of civilization became more frequent here and there was a village with cultivated fields around it cattle were pastured in enclosed paddocks and men and women with laughing children trudged along the high road looking after the motor with great curiosity for the machine was yet a novelty in that lonely district twice the road ran directly through a village and vernon had an opportunity of seeing the solid grey stone houses which were suited to the calvinistic looks of the country and the people themselves appeared to be what the scotch call door and now the moors began to grow higher and to close in on the white road with a gradual menace leaving the comparatively broad lands the motor glided into a valley which grew even more narrow as they proceeded a babbling stream prattled down the centre of this over a stony bed and beside it the road twisted along like a white serpent protected by a parapet of rough stones already the crimson light of the sunset had died out of the western sky but the moon was full and soaring high in the dark blue dome of the firmament poured floods of light into the gully to use a colonial expression for by this time it was little else and looking upward vernon could see star after star peep out to attend the majestic orb what do you call this place he asked abruptly towton glanced at him in surprise didn't i tell you it's bowderstyke great scott colonel is your house situated in this isolated damp spot i should think you never saw the sun from one year's end to the other save when it was directly overhead oh the valley broadens out further on this is merely the entrance what the deuce do the inhabitants live on it's like living in a drain oh confound you vernon said the colonel half annoyed it's one of the most beautiful places in the world if you were a yorkshire tyke you would admit that there is only the village of bowderstyke a mile away and the inhabitants live by pasturing their cattle on the moors on the heights above also there is a weaving and spinning industry the mills being driven by water power of which there is no lack this stream doesn't seem to have much water said vernon disdainfully you should see it in winter when the snows melt on the moors advised the colonel besides the water from the mills comes from hest's new reservoir and there is a never-failing supply this stream used to be much broader and its bed contained much more water but when the bolly dam was constructed of course the supply dwindled pipes run under this road to supply the several villages you saw just before we entered the valley where is the dam which our criminal friend built towton pointed straight ahead round the next corner you could see it but we do not go so far there was a small lake there up on the moors which fed this stream hest simply got engineers to dam the lake and prevent too much water going to waste down the bed of this torrent the dam runs right across the valley a mile and a half beyond my house but isn't that dangerous if it burst this valley would be flooded from end to end and everybody would be drowned to say nothing of the way in which the village would be smashed up 
well yes Towton pinched his nether lip uneasily i've thought of that myself many a time but i was abroad when the dam was constructed there certainly as i have often said should be an outlet for the water other than the pipes which supply bowderstyke and the villages outside the valley capacious as those same pipes undoubtedly are assuredly if the reservoir burst there would be a great loss of life and destruction of property but the bali dam is very strongly built so i have no fear of anything happening you can see it from my house and we'll pay it a visit in a day or two meanwhile this is bowderstyke village by this time they were passing through quite a number of small houses from the windows of which lights gleamed cheerfully the motor soon left these behind then swerved to the right looking up from the entrance to the valley and shortly began to climb a winding road at this point as the colonel had foretold the vale broadened abruptly and the high moors stood away so as to form a kind of deep cup up the side of this the road along which they were travelling sloped upward for some distance then turned on itself and sloped still higher shortly the motor attained the highest level and in the moonlight vernon could see the moors stretching for miles lonely and romantic a straight road ran parallel with the upper portion of the valley for close upon half a mile then appeared a miniature forest encircled by a high stone wall this was undoubtedly artificial as the moorlands were treeless and the unexpected woodland looked out of place amidst bleak surroundings the motor soon arrived at two tall stone pillars crested with heraldic monsters and passing through these spun up a short avenue to stop before a large white house brilliantly lighted up spacious lawns opened up before the mansion interspersed with flower beds now bloomless and the whole was shut in by the fairy forest as vernon called it in his own mind here we are said colonel towton jumping from the car allow me to welcome you to the grange my friend thank heaven the journey's at an end said vernon end of chapter seventeen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california chapter eighteen of the spider by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter eighteen at bowderstyke i hope you slept well vernon said the colonel to his guest the next morning when they were at breakfast like a top was the response that journey tired me out and your moorland air is so strong that i slept the moment my head was on the pillow you will eat well also vernon remarked towton regarding with satisfaction the attention paid by his visitor to the appetizing meal our air is famous as a tonic you will return to town a giant refreshed there is lots to be done before i leave here said vernon passing his cup for a fresh supply of coffee what is your first step we will call on miss hest this afternoon and i can show you the village at the same time lady corsoon and her daughter will come to-day and will arrive to dinner that is the programme i am at your disposal and to-morrow i suppose you will get lady corsoon to take charge of ida if miss hest will let her go said the colonel cautiously she can't detain her surely not by outward force but she may use her influence to keep her miss hest won't lose the chance of swaying the mind of a girl with ten thousand a year you may be sure of that hm said vernon finishing the last of his coffee if i'd have learned the secret of dimsdale from maunders disguised as diabella you may be sure that she told miss hest in that case ida is not worth keeping colonel towton nodded and pushed back his chair to rise there's something in that i'll admit however we can say nothing until we interview miss hest i have already sent her a note saying that we have arrived and will see her to-day matters having been thus arranged the two men lighted their pipes and strolled out into the grounds it was a bright autumnal morning with a cloudless blue sky and a radiant sun the moorland air was keen and vernon drew long invigorating breaths into his lungs notwithstanding the somewhat bleak surroundings the grange was a remarkably comfortable house 
and the original Towton, who had built the same, had striven to render it as bright as possible, so as to contrast with the sombre moors. The Grange, indeed, was more like an Italian villa than a Yorkshire mansion, as it was constructed of white stone, and every window had green shutters, while the roof was formed of cheerful red tiles. Both rooms and corridors were spacious and decorated in brilliant tints, and the furniture was of the most modern description. "'It isn't at all like an ancestral home, is it?' said Towton cheerfully. "'And all the better for that, since the word suggests oak parlours, comfortable gloom, and cumbersome furniture.' those would suit the situation better said vernon glancing at the pines and fir trees which formed a screen to keep away the too keen moorland winds your brilliant walls and red roofs look out of place in these stern solitudes where nature seems to be acting the anchorite i love the scenery and solitude and all that vernon but i like to be comfortably housed my great-grandfather left the original family seat which is in the valley almost below the bali dam and built this place after a long sojourn in italy my cousin from whom i inherit cleared out all the old victorian furniture and redecorated the house as you see it it's all very modern and perhaps in contrast with the grandeur of the moors somewhat frivolous but at all events it is cheerful and comfortable i could scarcely ask ida to inherit a kind of ogre's castle like gerby hall where is that you will see shortly it's a real old yorkshire manor house dating i believe from the wars of the roses there was a lot of fighting went on during those days in yorkshire and the original hest procured a grant of bowderstyke valley from edward the fourth but my ancestors came along later and seized a portion of it and built the mansion near the dam i understand that the hests and the towtons fought like cat and dog over the valley however the most of the property belongs to me and i live in this very up-to-date grange while they'll still cling to the remnants of their lands and to gerby hall from whom does our criminal friend inherit his grandfather hest's father was an officer in the indian army and had quarrelled with the old man then he died together with his wife some spinster he had married at simla the twin children were sent home to the grandfather who brought them up and left the estates to francis now that he has been shown up he has had the sense as i told you yesterday to hand them over to his sister perhaps she'll marry and carry on the family and hest the colonel shook his head who knows he may be caught on the other hand he may bolt to south america and become one of those dictators we read so much about as the spider we know that he has heaps of brains and a piratical life of that description would suit him exactly talking thus towton showed vernon over his small kingdom and after luncheon the two gentlemen strolled out of the grounds with the intention of taking the winding road to gerby hall on the verge of the moorland they stood for some time looking down into the cup and vernon thus procured a bird's-eye view of the valley in the full blaze of the noonday sun it's like a bead on a string towton he said after a pause the description was an apt one for the hollow into which they were looking was the bead and the narrow valley running like an irregular crack to right and left may be easily compared to a string from the cup upward to bali dam the valley stretched for a mile and a half and downward it ran for two miles in a somewhat crooked fashion to terminate on the verge of the undulating plain which stretched the further ten miles to the railway station at the end of the valley as towton informed his guest was a village called from its situation gatehead and there were four other hamlets beyond all of which belonged to him the hests were reduced to bowderstyke village alone and to a considerable portion of the moorland on the hither side it puts me in mind somewhat of blackmore's description of doon valley was vernon's remark when in possession of these facts i dare say in the middle ages it was quite a robber's stronghold with the hests and the towtons as robbers exactly their hand was against every man and likewise against each other for the mastery of bowderstyke at the upper end the valley is blocked by a small lake now turned by the bali dam into a very large reservoir 
so they were safe in that direction gatehead was where their vassals lived to guard the outlet so you can see in troublesome times everything was extremely safe from this valley the hests and the towtons went forth raiding and sometimes when not quarrelling between themselves formed a kind of league they struggled for centuries but in the end my ancestors got the upper hand and most of the property i believe the feud and the raiding continued down to the termination of george the third's reign for the king's writ did not run in these wilds where is gerby hull towton pointed directly downward under that cliff where the moorland rises so abruptly like the grange there is a kind of artificial forest around it so that it is concealed but as you can see it is almost within the village itself right in line of the flood should the dam break i fear so but i hope there is no chance of the dam breaking you see added the colonel pointing out the topography of the valley the village is divided by the ancient bed of the torrent now comparatively dry since the construction of the bali reservoir a stone bridge connects the two portions of the village and on this side nearest to ourselves the ground begins to rise gradually the other portion of the village and gerby hall lie in the hollow and are cut off from the sunlight i often wondered said towton musingly why the hests when lords of the entire valley should have chosen to build their manor house in such a situation for when the torrent was in full force from the melting of the moorland snows they must have been exposed to many an inundation and now said vernon glancing northward to where the cyclopean wall of the dam frowned in the sunlight if that great body of water were let loose both the village and the hall would be swept away they are certainly directly in the line of the flood replied towton unhesitatingly but both the hall and the village houses are strongly built of dark stone it would take some force to smash them if that dam broke colonel they would be swept away like straws on the surface of a whirlpool i can't understand what the engineers were thinking about to risk such a catastrophe towton laughed pooh pooh nothing is likely to happen but now that i rule here i intend to see if some outlet cannot be arranged other than down the valley so that all risk may be done away with i objected to the dam from the first although i admit that it is a work which is of great public utility and supplies bowderstyke gatehead and the other villages but it spoils my view and also is dangerous as you observe however we have talked enough on this dull subject let us descend and pay a visit to gerby hall miss hest will be expecting us and ida laughed vernon with a side glance at the suddenly flushed cheek of the soldier they descended by the winding road into the valley and after pausing to glance up the valley where the massive wall of the dam cut short the view proceeded slowly towards the village it was a collection of small dark houses built of moss-clothed grey stones and looked like a colony of dwarf buildings but the men and women who dwelt therein were tall and burly enough and the children seemed to be well grown besides the dwellings there were also two mills the wheels of which were driven by water in a very powerful fashion the few shops were dark and uninviting and the chief street narrow and crooked secluded as it was from the sun which never warmed the village with its beams save at noonday it did not appear to be a desirable residence but the inhabitants seemed cheerful enough and frequently greeted the colonel with gruff amiability although he was not their landlord that position as towton had informed his guest belonged to hest or rather since he had expatriated himself to his sister crossing the curved stone bridge which arched the dwindling torrent the colonel led his friend through several dismal streets until they emerged into an open space to see before them a high wall built of irregular blocks of stone covered with mosses and grasses and lichen the massive wooden gates which afforded entrance into the domain stood wide open indicating like the doors of the janus temple that the hests were at peace with their neighbours passing through these the visitors walked up a gloomy avenue where the branches of the trees met overhead and came unexpectedly upon a square stone house the appearance of which was similar to that of the encircling wall 
there were absolutely no pretensions to architectural beauty and the mansion looked as though it had grown out of the damp fecund ground where rank mosses grew in profusion above was the slightly sloping bank of the moorland which here was almost perpendicular and it threw a heavy shade over the frowning dwelling which suited its grim looks it was two-story with twelve windows in the front six on either side and three in each story in the centre was the door without a porch and without steps only a broad flagstone formed the threshold the trees grew up nearly to this and there was merely a narrow gravelled path between the luxuriant grasses and the walls of the house so amazingly dismal a dwelling vernon had never set eyes on and he uttered an exclamation when he beheld the desolation it's the very worst place ida could have come to he said in high displeasure what could miss hest have been thinking of to ask her to live in this vault ah uh, she will be better up on the heights in my italian villa vernon that is if she will come remarked the other gloomily for the sombre situation and ascetic looks of the hest mansion made his spirits sink to zero their approach had been seen for scarcely had they set foot on the flagstone and before they had time to raise a hand to the massive iron knocker which was covered with rust than the door was opened by a fat-faced stupid girl dressed in brown but with a tolerably neat cap and apron without inquiring their business and without speaking she signed that the two gentlemen should enter and conducted them to a room to the left of the cheerless hall here she intimated that they were to wait and that the mistress would soon come to them after which she retired sullenly and closed the door after her what with her looks and the gloom of the room and the closing of the door the visitors felt as though they had been bestowed in a dungeon anything more dismal can scarcely be conceived oh lord ejaculated vernon with dismay looking round at the old-fashioned furniture and the grimy red colouring of the decorations somewhat faded it is true within is worse than without i should commit suicide in such a place no wonder francis has found blackmailing a more cheerful pursuit he ought to have hush said towton sharply and arrested vernon's speech as the door opened to admit the mistress of the mansion miss hest looked graver than she had done at rangoon and more handsome than ever in her imperial masterful way vernon marvelled to see how much she resembled her brother although the disfiguring cicatrice was absent in her plain black dress slashed with deep orange miss hest looked like a spanish beauty and in the damp secluded mansion she seemed to flourish as healthily as though she dwelt in perpetual sunshine with a smile she came forward and greeted her visitors in a most cordial manner i am very glad to see you both said frances sitting down when formal greetings had passed and especially you colonel towton as i am anxiously waiting for your promised verbal answer to my letter i shall explain why i did not write you with pleasure said the colonel gravely although my explanation is painful you may even refuse to believe me miss hest she looked alarmed and her lips twitched nervously francis is all right i hope she inquired apprehensively his letter and the deed of gift alarmed me i think he must be crazy i don't think so rejoined towton dryly but before explaining may i ask how miss dimsdale is keeping francis shook her head dejectedly the death of her father is still preying on her mind and nothing i can say or do will make her cheerful perhaps this house began vernon she cut him short quickly i quite agree with you and i know what you are about to say it is too damp and too dismal for ida she is a flower who ought always to live in the sunshine lady corsoon is coming down to stay with me to-day ventured towton anxiously so miss dimsdale might come and stay at the grange it's a capital idea you can ask her for yourself and as i know she thinks a great deal of you colonel i hope you will be able to persuade her to pay the visit she will be here shortly but before she comes do tell me the meaning of my brother's extraordinary conduct what makes you think the colonel can explain asked vernon unexpectedly francis looked at him in surprise why i wrote after i received the deed of gift asking if he had seen francis 
the colonel replied that he would explain verbally when he came down i have no reason to think that he knows anything of my brother's private business and i was astonished to hear that he could tell me anything i only wrote because i wished the colonel to see ida and as an afterthought asked about my brother i thought you she addressed the colonel might have seen him in london i did replied towton gravely at professor gale's i know that he went there to deliver a message from me but why has he made over his property to me without a line of explanation save that he was going abroad did he tell you no but i am not surprised that he has done so francis looked from one man to the other and seeing their grave faces she grew white and anxious looking what do you mean we saw constantine maunders put in vernon well well what of that he was masquerading as diabella miss hest started to her feet as the fortune teller surely you must be mistaken it's impossible why should he do that why should he do many things said towton grimly but he has been leading a double life oh that's impossible why he was always as open as the day i asked him down here a week or so ago and he was coming at the eleventh hour he put me off saying that mrs bedge was ill i fancied that something might be wrong then but but oh she burst out clasping her hands you really must be mistaken he is such a nice young fellow he's a nice scoundrel said vernon heatedly spare your praises of him miss hest you won't think him so nice when i tell you that he accuses your brother of being the spider the spider who who is the uh she started to her feet as she suddenly remembered all that the information conveyed you mean that wretch who murdered poor mr dimsdale her brows grew black and she clenched her hands in a cold fury what do you mean by connecting my brother with it is not vernon or i who connect your brother with the spider maunders made the accusation and your brother endorsed it by his flight 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 my brother she drew herself up proudly has not fled why has he gone abroad then asked vernon hastily why has he made over his property to you believe me miss hest both the colonel and myself would be glad to spare you such a blow but there is no doubt that your brother is none other than this famous blackmailer for whom the police are searching so ardently the woman dropped back into her chair and clutched at her breast as though she felt a cruel pain in her heart her face looked grey in the dim light of the room and she suddenly seemed to have aged even her confident bearing fell away from her and she crouched as though smitten to the earth never was there so rapid or so terrible a transformation oh for god's sake she moaned brokenly for for my my brother heaven knows we did not get on over well together but that he he that he should it's a lie i tell you it's a lie why francis has given up all his life to doing good everyone round here blesses his name he was generous to a fault and you dare to dare to oh she leaped to her feet again and strove to recover her proud bearing i don't believe it liars both of you maunders is the liar and not us then said vernon quietly i never trusted him i never liked him moaned miss hest he is then she unexpectedly fell back again into her chair utterly unstrung and broken down an old grey woman miserable beyond belief francis my brother our good name oh oh say that it isn't true and she wept piteously i regret to say that it is said the colonel extremely sorry to dash her hopes to the ground and he rapidly related all that had been discovered as he proceeded miss hest lifted her face which grew more composed and is this all the evidence you have to go upon she inquired with scorn the word of a man whom you admit to be a scoundrel you forget said vernon gravely that your brother endorsed the accusation by flight and by taking his accomplice with him such an accusation might well make a man fail to stand his ground said the woman resolutely and on the spur of the moment francis may have lost his wits but he will return to repel this accusation from what you say of a deed of gift miss hest that does not seem likely to happen if your brother is innocent let him surrender himself to the police and stand his trial i shall advise him to do that at once where is he to be found 
no one knows and the police would give much to learn but you heard last from him since he sent the deed of gift and informed you of his plans there was no address on the letter said francis wringing her hands helplessly and he did not even promise to write when he went abroad for all i know he may have vanished for ever vernon made an observation that looks like guilt until francis admits with his own lips that he is the spider i decline to believe it said miss hest making a violent effort to recover her composure you forget that you indirectly accuse him of murdering poor mr dimsdale how can i his sister bear to hear that your feelings do you credit said towton sadly nevertheless stop she interrupted holding up her finger ida is coming not a word to her if you please certainly not neither vernon nor i shall say anything until say nothing until i see you again said francis rapidly i shall call at the grange and hear more when in possession of the facts i shall go to town and silence silence here is ida just as the name left her lips the door slowly opened and miss dimsdale entered both the gentlemen uttered exclamations of astonishment and pity at the sight of her altered appearance from being a bright and laughing girl rather plump than otherwise she had become thin and careworn and advanced with a shrinking air quite at variance with her known character the black dress she wore enhanced the melancholy of her appearance and the colonel being very much the lover grew darkly red at the sight how is it that miss dimsdale looks so ill he asked francis furiously she is worried over something and the air of this house doesn't suit her at all said miss hest who was trying to subdue her emotion again and again i have wanted her to return with me to london but but i won't go i won't go said ida in her soft voice don't look so angry richard it was the first time she had uttered his christian name and towton flushed with pleasure i am quite well you look extremely ill he replied bluntly ida sat down with a sigh that's not the fault of francis she has been like a sister to me ever since the death of my dear father ida come and stay at the grange lady corsoon is coming down this evening and i'm sure you will be happier there i can't leave francis nonsense said miss hest with something of her old vigour you will be much better with your own people ida if you stay here they will think that i am after your money oh francis when you know it's all nonsense dear the colonel here declares that diabella is or rather was constantine maunders masquerading as a fortune teller then what he said is are you talking of a secret of your father's ida asked vernon quickly was mr dimsdale my father she demanded facing round anxiously diabella that is constantine if what you say is true told me that i was not his daughter if so i have no right to the property and and she put her hand to her forehead oh my poor head towton crossed over and took her hand ida is it this which has been so troubling you he asked tenderly yes yes i wondered if what diabella said was true i could not be certain although i did want to see the lawyer and give up the property but francis said francis advised delay until the truth was known beyond all doubt said miss hest now quite composed for this did i send for you colonel towton ida is fonder of you than of any one else so you are the person who ought to marry her then you can look into the matter but francis cried ida much astonished i thought you wanted me to marry constantine or your brother both of them are bad matches now if what mr vernon says is true replied miss hest bitterly better take up with your old love what has been said questioned ida anxiously looking into the disturbed face of her friend better not ask muttered the woman and cast a warning glance at the two visitors least said soonest mended ida will you go to the grange and stay with your aunt ida ran to francis and falling on her knees threw her arms round her neck fondly what would you have me leave you when i see you are so sad something is wrong what is it you have comforted me so let me comfort you nothing can comfort me said miss hest in melancholy tones it's nothing my dear nothing at all i wish oh i wish she rose suddenly and ran towards the door i can't stand any more vernon was not surprised at miss hest's sudden departure 
Strong-minded as she was, the terrible news that her twin brother was a robber and a murderer and was being hunted down by the police had quite broken down her strength of character for the time being. He pitied her extremely, as he had always liked her more than Towton had done. So far as he could see, she was a kind-hearted woman, masterful it is true, but possessed of sterling qualities which that very trait enabled her to make good use of. To one of her inflexible honesty, the discovery of her brother's sin must have been gall and wormwood. Meanwhile, the colonel, holding Ida's hand within his own, was pleading anxiously that she should visit the Grange and regain her health in the cheerful society of her aunt and cousin. "'And I can explain all about the story told by Maunders masquerading as Diabella,' coaxed Towton softly. But Ida was in no mood to listen to her lover or to yield to his wiles. She pulled her hands away hurriedly and spoke with pettish haste. "'How can you bother me about such things when Frances is so ill? I must go to her at once.' And she glided rapidly towards the door, evading Towton, who would have detained her. "'Ida, Ida, do listen to me.' "'No, no, no. On another occasion when I see you again, tomorrow or the next day. But Francis is ill. Francis wants me.' She opened the door quickly. "'Coming, dear, coming!' and without a glance at the visitors vanished from the room. Her heart seemed to be rather with Miss Hest than with the lover who so ardently adored her. The gentlemen looked at one another in dismay. This did not seem a propitious moment for Towton's wooing, as Ida appeared to be entirely infatuated with her friend. There was nothing left for them to do but to take a speedy departure and to return on a more fitting occasion. Miss Hest, being naturally troubled in her mind, was not likely to reappear, and Ida undoubtedly would decline to leave her friend's side. Not unreasonably, the Colonel felt very cross. "'Ida seems to be crazy about that infernal woman,' he snapped irritably. "'She is very faithful to those she loves, and therefore will make you the better wife,' said Vernon gravely. "'I want her to be faithful to me, and not to Miss Hest,' retorted Towton. "'It is ridiculous that she should behave in this manner. What's to be done now?' "'We must wait till Lady Corsoon comes. She has plenty of good sense, and may be able to talk Ida into a reasonable frame of mind.' i can't see where lady corsoon's good sense comes in seeing that she is a gambler and has risked her husband's displeasure in pawning family jewels vernon however only one woman can talk round another so your suggestion is a good one meanwhile just ring the bell for someone to show us out of this condemned vault vernon pulled the old-fashioned bell rope and shortly as though she had been listening on the outside of the door a tall, lean woman with a white face and a prim, pinch-lipped smile made her entrance. Without waiting to be addressed, she introduced herself to the visitors. "'Miss Dewin, gentlemen,' she said with a stiff curtsy, "'what can I do for you?' At the sound of her voice, Vernon started and looked at her closely, but whatever he saw, he said nothing at the moment, merely intimating that he and his friend desired to part and tell miss hest we will call to-morrow with lady corsoon said the colonel aggressively and stalked out preceded by miss jewin still primly smiling and looking like a white cat not until they were in the village did vernon explain why he had started at the sound of the housekeeper's voice that woman he said is the very one who admitted me into the empty house in west kensington and who locked me in the kitchen End of chapter 18, read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California. Chapter 19 of The Spider by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 19 a bold offer lady corsoon duly arrived and duly complained of the length of the journey the strain to which her nerves were subjected on account of the suspense she suffered regarding the suspider's blackmailing rendered her somewhat irritable and those around felt the effects of her temper but lucy having a singularly placid nature invariably contrived to soothe down her mother's ruffled plumes while the two men, knowing what Lady Corsoon felt, paid her every attention. 
the next morning therefore she felt somewhat better and acknowledged that the grange was endurable but she resolutely refused to call straightway at gerby hall i shall go to-morrow she said when towton urged the visit my nerves must have time to recover from the journey into these wilds besides ida should call and see me since i am the elder but i wish you to persuade ida to take up her quarters while you remain pleaded the colonel she is infatuated with miss hest and will i am certain not come here of her own accord i'm sure i never could understand what ida saw in that woman said lady corsoon fretfully miss hest is nice enough and quite agreeable but nothing out of the ordinary when my poor dear brother died ida should have accepted my guardianship i offered twice to look after her but she refused because of this hest woman i presume you must remember lady corsoon that ida is a spoilt child spoilt interrupted the lady i should think so many a time have i implored martin not to ruin her but i might as well have spoken to a block of stone you will have no easy task to manage her when you make her your wife colonel i am quite certain that when ida is removed from the companionship of miss hest i shall be able to manage her with the greatest ease said towton emphatically but the question is how to get her away i look to you to use your influence dear lady mine why i never had the least influence with that headstrong girl my dear colonel i'll go to-morrow and give her a talking to and perhaps i may be able to induce her to return with me to london but while she is the mistress of ten thousand a year she can defy me now if the spider can give me that fortune as he declares i shall soon bring ida to see that she must behave like a sensible human being i suppose mr vernon told you of the letter i received he hinted as much to me though i think he should have held his tongue he did hold his tongue about your business more or less lady corsoon it was mr maunders who let slip the secret and what business is it of mr maunders i should like to know asked lady corsoon putting up her lorgnette and looking haughtily at towton this much that he wrote the letter what lady corsoon bounded from her seat then he is the spider no said the colonel prudently who did not intend to tell his companion more than he could help as he placed no reliance on her tongue but knowing from yourself about the first letter you received from the spider and anxious to marry your daughter he made use of the blackmailer's scheme to secure his own ends what audacity can he mr maunders i mean really place me in possession of martin's money i can't answer that for the moment replied the colonel carefully but at any rate by promising to do so he hoped to marry miss lucy he shall never do that cried lady corsoon energetically unless of course he keeps his promise lucy must save me from she hesitated mr maunders told me about your losses at bridge and and that i pawned certain family jewels finished the lady well i never to think he should discuss my affairs in this way i have been a fool i don't deny that i have been a fool but there was no need for mr maunders to let the whole world know the world is only represented by myself and vernon said the colonel dryly and your secret is safe with us but mr maunders he has his hands full you won't see him again but in that case his promise my dear lady corsoon i do not think he will be able to keep his promise for certain reasons which i need not tell you now better give your consent to the marriage of vernon and miss lucy they love one another and he will soon have a title and an income did you invite me down with lucy to forward that marriage asked lady corsoon with sudden suspicion partly answered towton coolly and partly because i wish to enlist you on my side as regards ida oh i am willing to help you but as to mr vernon he is with lucy now yes they have gone for a walk lady corsoon frowned lucy could make a much better match she said hesitating with constantine maunders for instance at all events he promises me ten thousand a year on what grounds i don't know then believe me he is only bluffing but he knows about my pawning of the jewels and even if this horrid spider creature holds his tongue mr maunders may tell sir julius 
then heaven only knows what would happen julius is so impossible i shall engage that maunders remains silent if you will give your consent to the marriage after all miss lucy would be lady vernon she could be a countess if she played her cards well i really don't know what to say i am in the dark so to speak wait until i see ida and then i may form an opinion how can ida help you to do so she may be able to tell me if there was a will in my favour i really believe from that letter of the spider's will of mr maunders since you say he wrote it that martin left the money to me and that ida destroyed the will i'm sure she's capable of it permit me to remind you lady corsoon said the colonel sternly that miss dimsdale is to be my wife and that i shall not permit anyone to cast a slur on her character if the money is left to you she will hand it over what ten thousand a year said lady corsoon beaming oh she would be a good girl if she did that well i shall wait and see in the meantime i do not mind mr vernon being with lucy colonel towton shrugged his square shoulders he thought that the lady was making a virtue of necessity as the young couple had taken french leave after breakfast and had vanished and had lady corsoon been gifted with supernatural sight she would scarcely have been pleased had she seen the two sitting by bolly dam with their arms round one another also lucy the meek the amiable the well-conducted was kissing vernon in the boldest manner and swearing that she would marry him and him only mother wants me to marry mr maunders said lucy snuggling up close to her lover and papa desires me to become the wife of lord stratham but i shall only marry you darling you arthur she pressed her cheek against his breast and looked up into his eyes run away with me would you elope if i asked you i have just offered to elope without your asking me she replied nodding i can't speak plainer can i oh dear me she sighed resting her head on her lover's shoulder how weary i am of everything papa is always busy in the city and has hardly a word to say to me mamma has some secret worry about which she will not speak and i am left to find my own amusements do take me away arthur isn't gretna green somewhere about these parts let us go there and get married no dear i don't think there will be any need for a runaway match unless it is the romance of the thing that you desire colonel towton has promised to speak to your mother and i have an idea that he will get her to consent to our marriage she consented before pouted miss corsoon and then changed her mind why i am sure i don't know it's much better to get married quietly and then she would have to forgive us my dear said vernon firmly i prefer to act honourably and openly from a letter i received this morning it seems that my poor uncle cannot live much longer in a month at the latest i shall be in possession of the property and the title then i shall see your father and demand your hand he likes me and when he learns of my new circumstances i am sure he will consent with him on our side your mother will be quite willing to accept me as her son-in-law i'll do whatever you say dearest whispered lucy fondly only i'll never marry any one but you so there and she gave him a kiss which her lover promptly returned then they sat hand in hand looking at the view and too happy to speak further love's silence is more eloquent than love's speech before them the reservoir rippled under the breath of a gentle wind and spread like a vast blue lake toward the purple of the moorlands immediately in front of the lovers the massive wall of the dam stretched from side to side of the valley which here was extremely narrow looking at the vast body of water vernon could not help doubting the strength of the protecting wall as the wavelets almost lipped its top there was a channel on the hither side with floodgates but it seemed too small to carry off much superfluous water in summer time the dam was no doubt all that could be desired in the way of strength but when the winter snows melted on the moorlands it appeared probable at least vernon knowing nothing of engineering thought so that the water would overflow the dam in that case it might break down the wall and then the young man shuddered to think of what would happen the whole contents of the lake narrowed by the gorge would shoot down the three odd miles of the valley with the force and condensation of a hose and assuredly would sweep it clean from end to end 
to make things safe said vernon aloud and giving speech to his thoughts there should be two channels for wastewater each broader than the single one over there i am sure there will be a catastrophe some winter or spring oh lucy pouted again i speak of love and you bother yourself over this silly old puddle it would prove to be anything but a puddle if the dam broke said vernon doubtfully i hope towton will take steps to make things safer bowderstyke village and gerby hall would be smashed to pieces if this vast body of water discharged itself without leave and he stared anxiously at the placid lake miss corsoon rather annoyed by his unlover-like conduct rose quickly and consulted a tiny jewelled watch pinned to her blouse it's nearly luncheon time she said with an affectation of indifference and i am so hungry hungry vernon caught her words when we are together i can't live on love and you keep talking of this stupid waterworks we really must go home arthur as mamma will be wondering what has become of us you don't wish to get me scolded i'll bear half of the scolding hello who is this he shaded his eyes with his hand and looked across the reservoir to where a tall figure appeared on the broad parapet of the dam the figure it was that of a man came swiftly across but midway caught sight of the lovers for one minute the stranger stared as if thunderstruck and then retreated as quickly as he had appeared lucy caught hold of her lover's coat to prevent his following where are you going arthur who is it hokar said vernon greatly excited but pausing for the moment it's the hindu who tried to strangle me and the colonel What? lucy's voice sounded so terrified that he turned at once to apologize and excuse himself nothing dear nothing but this hokar is a dangerous native of india whom i wish to get hold of he went down into the valley on the other side so i must don't leave me don't leave me wailed lucy desperately retaining him i wish you wouldn't frighten me arthur come home at once but i want to follow hokar it is necessary it is necessary to see me home insisted miss corsoon firmly i won't be left alone with wild indians and strangling people vernon was torn between his desire to stay with lucy and the feeling that it was his duty to follow horkar he wished to meet the hindu face to face and force him to speak as he was the servant of maunders masquerading as diabella he probably knew something if not indeed a great deal about hest and a few questions might intimate the villain's whereabouts but the man had already vanished and it would be difficult to trace him although vernon had a shrewd suspicion that he was to be found at gerby hall for a moment the young man hesitated between duty and pleasure then under the reproachful gleam of lucy's eyes pleasure gained the victory vernon escorted miss corsoon back to the grange comforting himself with the reflection that it was necessary to consult colonel towton before taking any steps to bring hokar to book all the way home lucy chatted in a lively manner but preoccupied with his own thoughts vernon was somewhat absent-minded a cause of offence to the girl but how could any man give way to the ruling passion of love when one of the villains concerned in a dangerous conspiracy against society was in the neighbourhood vernon wondered how hokar had come to these solitudes and how hest had succeeded in lulling his sister's suspicions so that she might receive the man for on the face of it hokar must be staying at gerby hall after a merry luncheon during which lady corsoon bearing in mind her late conversation with her host was very gracious to vernon the ladies departed to their boudoir the mother to rest and the daughter to write letters lucy indeed wished to call and see ida but lady corsoon refused to let her go alone and again expressed her determination not to pay a visit until the next day lucy always anxious to keep her parent in a good temper was obliged to fall in with this arrangement and followed lady corsoon out of the room it could be easily seen that the wily wife of the millionaire was unwilling to leave her daughter in the too fascinating society of vernon and evidently had made up her mind not to consent to the match until she was certain that her late brother's fortune would not come into her hands left alone with the colonel the young man related how unexpectedly hokar had appeared and disappeared on the dam towton listened frowningly and considered a while before expressing his opinion there is something suspicious about all this he said at length 
here is miss jewin the very woman who tricked you into becoming a prisoner at that west kensington house and here also is hokar the hindu so closely connected with maunders and for all we know with hest what do you make of it all it's a gang of thieves said towton unhesitatingly hokar bahadur miss jewin maunders and hest are all banded together under the leadership of the last as the spider he has vanished and so has maunders so i expect he sent down the hindus here in order that they might be out of the way and miss jewin she has always been the housekeeper at gerby hall vernon but i dare say hest got her to come to london to be used as a tool knowing that he could trust her she is a very old and faithful woman and i believe was the nurse of both hest and his sister the people hereabouts call her an old witch and she is credited with all manner of occult powers i can understand miss hest not being suspicious of miss jewin said vernon thoughtfully as she may have gone to london ostensibly for a trip and then would have returned in the ordinary course of things but miss hest must surely wonder at the presence of hokar i am bound to say that i did not see bahadur he may be here or he may not rejoined the colonel we'll soon find out to-morrow i go with lady corsoon to see ida and then i can warn miss hest of the character of the man if indeed she doesn't know it towton you surely don't suspect miss hest of knowing anything about her brother's wickedness no i don't say that and yet it is strange the hindu should be there and why should he be lurking about the bali dam i shall go myself to-morrow after i have seen miss hest to make an examination what do you mean i mean that a crafty devil like hokar doesn't take walks for the benefit of his health now that he may be tampering with the dam perhaps by order of francis hest in that case why not have the dam examined to-day there is no immediate hurry hokar will find it no easy task to break down that gigantic wall if that is his aim besides the vicar is calling this afternoon to pay respects to lady corsoon i wish to have a chat with him on the subject of hest and to learn what he thinks of him what can he think but that hest is a genuine philanthropist i dare say hest is one person here and another in london however it will do no harm to collect what information we can concerning him to-morrow you can come with lady corsoon and her daughter to see ida and i shall go also afterwards you can inspect the dam won't you come too asked vernon no the fact is i intend to ride to gatehead to-morrow afternoon i shall leave you and the ladies at gerby hall my steward wants to see me about some property which requires looking after in one of the near villages it will be easy for me to ride there and look into the matter myself i can trust you to amuse my guests thus it was arranged and vernon put all questions concerning hokar and bali dam out of his head lucy managed to evade the watchfulness of her mother when that good lady fell asleep and the lovers had a stolen half-hour all to themselves until the arrival of the vicar after that came tea and gossip and a very pleasant afternoon ended gleefully but the most important event of the next twelve hours happened after dinner when the colonel was called out of the drawing-room to see a visitor he left vernon to amuse lady corsoon and her daughter and took his way to the library where the visitor who had not sent in any name was waiting for him to towton's surprise the stranger proved to be francis hest my dear lady why did you not join us in the drawing-room he asked hospitably i am sure the surprise would be a pleasant one not to lady corsoon said francis quietly she is not over fond of me besides i have come to see you privately on a most important matter ida cried the colonel anxiously is she ill no no set your mind at rest about ida she has not changed since you saw her yesterday she doesn't know that i am here nor does any one else not even your servant as i gave no name when i was admitted is the door closed and she cast a searching nervous look around this room is perfectly private said towton noting that she looked anxious and haggard nothing mentioned here can be heard i hope nothing is wrong francis sat down and sighed heavily this much is wrong she said with a gloomy look that i have learned the truth about my brother the truth what you told me yesterday is the truth said miss hest bitterly he is a scoundrel and as it seems probable a murderer 
yet i had no suspicions of him not even when he sent that indian down here hokar said towton secretly pleased that his doubts on this point were about to be resolved yes some time ago he came here with a letter from francis saying that he was to remain here for a time i gave him house-room and did not pay much attention to the man as i thought it was only another of my brother's philanthropic schemes but from what you said yesterday this hokar is connected with mr maunders and my brother in their wickedness oh francis struck the table with her clenched hands to think that our name should be so disgraced by my brother what have you discovered that he is the spider yes there can be no doubt of that see she took a long blue envelope from her pocket and opened it to display a paper this is a mortgage on gerby hall and on all the property she explained the deed of gift to me is worth nothing interest is due on the mortgage and unless it is paid the man to whom the money is owing will foreclose no wonder francis presented me with the estates they are worth nothing and less than nothing i am actually a pauper oh i am extremely sorry to hear that miss hest but how does this paper prove that your brother is the spider it proves that i am a pauper and nothing more but i discovered amongst my brother's papers the will of poor dimsdale towton started to his feet what is there a will yes it is signed by martin dimsdale and witnessed by george venery of singapore and walter smith of hong kong after what you said yesterday i made up my mind that i would no longer be in the dark regarding my brother's doings i therefore broke open his desk which he always kept safely locked and found a written statement regarding ida not being mr dimsdale's daughter but the child of a certain mr menteith your brother must have learned that story from miss jewin said the colonel for maunders declared that she knew the history i quite believe it replied miss hest for the statement was signed by sarah jewin i have not spoken to her yet but i shall do so to-morrow she was in india with my father and mother and afterwards in burma i expect she heard the story there and related it to francis he added to it oh towton remembered about the embroidery to the tale then mr dimsdale did not purposely delay the relief exhibition which was to rescue Monteith. no he pressed on with all speed but francis invented that wicked lie so as to get money from mr dimsdale how francis got the will i can't say he certainly called at rangoon once or twice when he was in london but i scarcely think mr dimsdale would have given him the will probably he stole it i'm sorry to hurt your feelings miss hest added the colonel hastily on seeing her wince but your brother is extremely clever in a criminal way and nothing he does surprises me i quite believe he was clever enough to get this will where is it i have left it at home and if you will call to-morrow i shall give it to you but i must make conditions conditions the colonel looked puzzled ah don't think badly of me said francis in an imploring manner but consider my position i am without a penny for the property must certainly be handed over to a man to whom it is mortgaged listen colonel this will states that ida is not the testator's daughter and leaves everything to ida menteith so there can be no doubt that she inherits now ida loves you and although i wished her to marry my brother or mr maunders she always desired to be your wife i am glad now that she did not yield to my persuasions since both francis and constantine are criminals and exiles so i want you to take her away to-morrow and marry her and enter into possession of the dimsdale property you are very good miss hest said towton who could not but acknowledge that she was acting most generously but your condition it is scarcely that colonel merely a suggestion i shall give you the will if you can arrange with ida to give me eight or nine or ten thousand pounds so that i can have something to live on towton hesitated at this bold offer i can't say anything about that it is for miss dimsdale to decide colonel if i choose ida would remain with me altogether as she loves me say rather said towton somewhat unjustly that you have a great influence over her miss hest and if i have cried francis rising to the height of her tall figure has that influence been used for otherwise but good instead of misusing it as i could to keep ida beside me and retain command of her money i wish her to marry you and take her fortune entirely to yourself all i ask is for a sum to save me from begging my bread in the street 
think of my position and do not be too hard on me colonel i admit that you do have some claim said the colonel politely and doubtless miss dimsdale will consent to your demand but i can say nothing it will be better to wait until when until to-morrow then with ida we can talk over the matter miss hest's lip curled you are a strange man colonel i offer you a pretty wife and a handsome fortune yet you hesitate to do me justice i see no justice in giving you ten thousand pounds retorted towton sharply well said frances suppressing her rising anger for she felt that she was acting generously and the colonel churlishly perhaps justice is not quite the word which should be used but you spoke now of my influence over ida as being great and you spoke truly she is very fond of me and i am perfectly well able to induce her to give up all idea of becoming your wife and to get her to remain with me then i should handle the sum i ask for every year instead of only once for ida knows nothing of business see here miss hest said towton roundly i love ida and i wish her to be my wife but she shall accept me of her own free will and without being pressed in any way your influence can scarcely be so great as you think since ida declined both to marry maunders or your brother although as you admit you urged her to do so i am coming to-morrow with lady corsoon and her daughter to see ida and i hope miss dimsdale will return with her aunt to this house not if i can prevent it said frances her colour rising as she hastily wrapped her cloak around her and moved towards the door ida remains with me as a hostage until i get this money to which i am entitled i fail to see that because you have an ungenerous nature she retorted were i in possession of an unencumbered estate i should ask nothing but as it is i must have money and if you are wise you will buy this will and your wife with a sincere promise i do not even ask for it to be in writing so confident am i in your honour to give me ten thousand pounds on the wedding day but towton was singularly obstinate wait until to-morrow he said dourly what ida says i hold by in that case i have the money retorted frances and left the room promptly with a dry smile and a light step fully satisfied that she had won End of chapter 19, read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California.